My name is Rick Gentile. I've um, been at MathWorks about seven years now. Prior to MathWorks, I worked um, at a couple of different places that built radars, uh, Lincoln Laboratory and, um, and MITRE. Um, I've also worked at analog devices where I was focusing on signal processing systems that would go into some of these, these kinds of uh, radar and EW systems. Uh, so I look forward to sharing this with you and um, we'll, we'll go ahead and get started. <clears throat> we'll, we'll share the slides as well uh, afterwards. So the agenda for today's uh, system maps those uh, bullets that we included in the agenda. Uh, we'll start with some radar system engineering and kind of a, a view of getting started from an analysis standpoint. Um, we'll look at the scenario environment that you can use to build up your uh, radar models. Um, we'll we'll um, build up models and look at signal and data processing. So uh, the signal processing is everything that's required to generate a detection in a radar. And the data processing includes things like uh, multi-object tracking and um, classification, for example, uh, to name a few. Um, we'll also look at, once we have a model in place, extending the fidelity of the model uh, from the antenna standpoint, from the target standpoint, and also even from RF. Um, we'll look at some deep learning examples where we apply deep learning techniques to um, augment some of the traditional approaches that we have for target classification or system performance and, and um, talk about the, the CPU, GPU, um, uh, FPGA kind of workflows that you can use and, and how they map to some of the things that I show you today. Um, I should mention each of these topics is actually a separate um, probably one hour session. So I've tried to take the best of each of the sections. So um, I've, I've, um, I'll, I'll kind of get a broad picture across the board of the workflow. But um, if any of these topics are interesting, just let us know and we can do more detailed sessions on each of these topics uh, directly. I, I also, uh, if folks, I know I've seen some folks that potentially um, have traveled to the radar conference before. We'll be actually be in the radar conference um, next week uh, in, um, <clears throat> or, or, sorry, in two weeks in New York City. Uh, this is the, the IEEE radar conference. And also um, in April, uh, we'll also be in um, in London for the uh, European uh, Radar Conference as well as part of European Microwave Week. So if you're if you're there, let, uh, be be happy to uh, meet with you as well. All right, let's get started. Um, I have a couple of high level slides that I want to start with, just to kind of set the the stage for what we're looking at. <clears throat> um, earlier last year in 21A, we um, we introduced the Radar Toolbox, and so a lot of what I talk about today will be will be grounded in Radar Toolbox. Um, you may be familiar with uh, a product called Phased Array System Toolbox, and that's also, you'll see uh, elements of that as part of the presentation today. Um, so, so if you think of uh, Radar Toolbox and Sensor Fusion and Tracking Toolbox, when we look at some of the trackers that we have, I'll, a lot of that we'll, we'll be showing in some of the examples that I go through. But, but the goal here is to provide you building blocks with, for each of the subsystems of a radar system. Uh, so from antenna on RF, signal, data processing, and um, even resource management controls, Equally important is the environment and the scenarios that you operate in. We've put a lot of emphasis on making the um, the scenarios uh, more realistic and, and make it look like what you're, you're gonna, your radars are going to see in the in the field. Um, <clears throat> we'll also look at uh, integrating with the larger MathWorks um, framework for development across the board. So you know the model-based system engineering and being able to use the tools as a platform for all the the people on the team to uh, develop and uh, integrate with. So I'll, I'll show you some examples of how we do that. I think um, <clears throat> the, I'll use some simple examples in this, um, in this session just to kind of make it easy to, to grasp like the, the, the building blocks that we have. But I do want to show you just kind of a montage of things. This is an air traffic control system, aircraft approaching the airport. Um, this, uh, this picture, this, this next one that, I, that I'm showing here is a, a urban air mobility where we have a drone with a radar and a LIDAR on it. Uh, surveilling a um, an urban environment where there's other uh, autonomous systems present, uh, and we we can we can model the radar systems, the lidar systems, and then fuse the data. Um, the next the next picture here is a um, a, dist a radar in the distance, and you can see that there's a there's a drone um, by this see, see this little uh, measurement here in the middle. It's sort of following the terrain. There's also a ground vehicle. Uh, so here we're modeling the radar, the trajectories of the targets, and looking at uh, how we can uh, see some of these. And you can see in this case, they're actually in the presence of terrain. Sometimes they're occluded based on where the, where the mountain is. Um, this is a, on the bottom left here, you can see a picture of a system of systems where we have multiple um, radars focused on a, on a certain area with some overlap. And so we, um, we model the radar systems and we can um, uh, fuse data from multiple radars into a single uh, picture. Uh, this is actually a, um, this next one here on the bottom is a satellite 
uh, uh, tracking system. So there's ground-based radars that are tracking satellites. So we import satellite orbits and um, <clears throat> and keep track of um, you know many objects uh, in this case satellites. And there's there's a corresponding one where we look at space debris, which has even more um, objects in in the field of view of the radar systems. And we're we're looking at uh, fusing, modeling everything, and then fusing the data and, and building up that system. So. Um, <clears throat> I'm happy to go through these in more detail uh, later, but but I just want to give you a sense of the the you know the, everything that I show you will scale up to larger, much larger systems that you can put together. You see the, the get a sense of the kinds of visualizations, the fact that you can generate detections and targets and things like this, and track multiple objects. I think I just wanted to um, show you that. So I think you know part of what we've been focused also on is making it easier to share models <clears throat> um, across organizations in the ecosystem. Uh, from government to research to people that build systems, integrate systems, uh, to people that use the systems. And the idea here is that, you know, with the radar model, um, being able to have, make it easy to generate benchmarks and um, uh, systems that you can use for your test bench, uh, and also be able to track what the, what the actual operational, operational system will provide in terms of performance, and be able to um, have that modeling capability that can be uh, shared across the, across the, um, the ecosystem. And also you'll see across different stages of the project. Um, and that, that kind of brings us to the next slide here, which is <clears throat> I'm gonna talk about three uh, levels of abstraction that we, that we um, provide support for. The first one we refer to as system level analysis, where think of it as more like radar equation based that's, you know, uh, you can generate C code for. Um, <clears throat> more recently, we've focused on generating single precision C code for anything in the signal processing and data processing chain, tracking, um, beam forming and um, let's see. Okay, can you still see my screen? Okay. Yes. Change. Okay, this yes. looks, looks good. Okay, I saw something in Teams that changed a little bit. <clears throat> um, so so, um, so everything that I talked about, you can generate C code for, single precision C code. And you can also, um, especially in the signal processing area for beam forming, direction of arrival, there's work, there's flows to show how to do um, generate HDL and, um, on the data processing side, typically we think of trackers. Uh, we've got great uh, examples for uh, generating C code. Um, as we move closer to the AI classification piece, then all the processing elements are in play, GPU, um, CPU, and FPGA. So we'll talk some more about that as we go forward here. All right, so um, as I said, um, most, of the, most of the sections here are now further sliced by each of these four quadrants, the radar system engineering piece, the data uh, synthesis and scenarios, uh, AI and uh, the cognitive radar portion where we look at, put a lot of these things together. So you'll see this little icon as we go through that uh, sort of grounds you in where we are in this kind of uh, uh, circle. So the first um, big piece that uh, Radar Toolbox focused on was on budget analysis. And again, this is something that has traditionally been done, every place I've worked at before has been done with spreadsheets. And we're really talking about the fundamental parameters of the radar being able to be captured in in a form that um, that makes it easy to be consistent across uh, uh, teams and across uh, even people on the same project. So you'll see us uh, in the in the app here looking at things like um, the link budget in forms of de detectability, plotting this on a waterfall display. I'll show you that in action as we go forward here. All the pieces here, th there's a lot of off the shelf components, but of course, um, one of the nice things about MATLAB is you always have the flexibility. So we've tried to preserve that in any, where, any of these apps that I show you, where you can actually plug your own models in as well. Um, equally important is the external portion. So we're talking about all the, the, the pieces like the target and all the environmental conditions that we'll go through. Um, you're gonna see a lot of new plots that we've added in. You can generate these plots directly with you know line, single lines of um, MATLAB code. Um, but a lot of this is structured around what you would normally do in the radar equation. So you'll see plots and you'll see also uh, metrics that you can specify for a radar design. And the, the, the form of this will be, um, I love this part of it because the units are here and this is usually where a lot of mistakes are made <clears throat> in terms of bookkeeping. So you can set the units and ensure consistency uh, uh, to apples to apples comparisons. Um, for each of the designs, you'll have a threshold objective and you'll be able to, to assess your design um, across the threshold and objective and see if it's green, yellow, or red. In this case, green means that the threshold and the objectives are met. Yellow means the threshold is met, but not the objective. And red would mean that um, not, neither is met. So I'll show, I'll show you some of that in action. Some plots that you'll see more of, scene geometry, uh, range Doppler coverage, the um, Blake chart, the type displays, and also cluttered or noise as an example. 
in addition to that spotlight chart that I showed you um, that I showed you earlier. Let me show you let me show you the app in general. So I'm going to switch over to the um, the Radar Designer app. And <clears throat> what I like about the, uh, the the kind of the getting started piece here is if you're if you're getting started and you wanted to just pick one of our templates that we have. There's a there's a range of templates that you can pick from that are are, are generic based on uh, published publicly available uh, data sheets of these kinds of radars. Um, once you once you build your own uh, radar model, you can actually uh, save it save it as a session, and when you um, restart, you can open it back up at, uh, and have it already populated. So you it makes it easy to get pick up where you left off uh, after you're done with the app, but it also uh, helps you. Um, uh, share it across the team, right? You can you can have a specific, you know, radar type A, and have that be the the model that you you do once and share many times. Um, <clears throat> I think the other piece here is that um, these these three tabs on the on the left are the 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 um, the area you specify your your information. So things like your your radar parameters. There's a whole list of um, of different radar uh, parameter types, um, including you know the, the the ones you'd expect frequency and and um, Antenna and scanning uh, gains and losses, detection and tracking, other loss factors. These are all ones that you would typically work on uh, if you're if you're working with a radar equation. There's also a corresponding tab for target and um, and the environmental conditions. And depending on whether you ch check free space or not, or you have um, you, you end up getting um, the effects of um, uh, a curved Earth and other environmental conditions. There's a whole bunch of of these kinds of um, uh, knobs to turn to make it look more like what you're um, uh, what you're what you're going to be uh, looking at. The um, the plots that I mentioned to you earlier are all available as just button clicks up on top here. So you can see once you once you've set the um, the plots that you want to look at, they they show up in tabs on the right, and you can um, cycle through each of these for the specific um, for the specific uh, use case that you're looking at. Um, I'm showing it here for one radar, this next generation radar alternative, but you can actually um, duplicate or add additional ones here and then compare multiple radars for the same the same scenario and same um, um, target piece. The, um, the the stoplight picture that I showed you earlier um, looks something like um, this um, PD versus range um, gives you the whatever your max whatever you're set to your constraint here. In this case, we can either constrain it to probability detection or max range. And what I what I have here is if I want to be able to detect a target at a certain spot, I can figure out exactly where I am in this um, PD versus range curve. And hopefully I'm in the green or yellow, ideally all green, right? And I can I can continue to evolve and uh, uh, experiment with with parameters on the left to get my my design uh, correct. Um, when I'm done with this with this um, aspect, I can export the um, either the script that generates whatever I've done in the radar designer, or I can um, generate a report, a metrics report that then I can use. And, and if you want to, you can actually put that back into a spreadsheet. There's actually um, code that you, if you uncomment it out, you can generate a, um, uh, a, a, a something you could bring back into a spreadsheet, like I said. So um, so all of these are, are nice because it's a way to get started and capture the design that you have here. As I said, I, I've, I'm only showing one here, but if I if I added another radar here, I could I could just make this many radars uh, lined up next to each other and see exactly how design parameters um, get um, get compared in, in these designs. Um, so normally I would export this and, and start with that piece. I've already done that, so I'll show you that a little bit more in action as I go forward here. Um, <clears throat> I've also uh, okay so. Um, as over time, we'll continue to evolve um, the um, all the functions in the radar into the app, uh, and, and the next the next one that will, will be included will be SAR. But I wanted to just take a, a minute to show you some of the SAR workflows because um, a lot of that system engineering work that I talked about um, is 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 uh, discoverable and usable in the app. But there's many other functions that are still available at the at the um, scripting level to be able to work on, and we. We have two of these in the uh, that focus on system parameters and performance metrics for SAR rate uh, SAR systems. One spaceborne, one uh, aircraft. And so, from a function standpoint, there's there's a wealth of functions that focus on basically building up. You can see some of the parameters that we do in these examples: antenna size, orientation, the footprint of the beam, all, all the pieces that you would do if you were designing a system to to, to achieve some requirements. Uh, similarly, there's there's um, 
there, there's portions for the um, MTI processing as well. So a lot of um, a lot of things to pick from. I just show this. Um, this this is actually in the help, but I just had to take a snapshot of it. You can see there's probably about um, 50 or 60 functions that are focused just on the working with the radar equation and that um, that either generate an answer and or a plot, uh, one of those convenience plots that I showed you um, showed you earlier. And they span the whole the whole uh, spectrum of different things. This the, just for SAR, uh, these are all the SAR ones that I that I mentioned that, that are kind of brought out in some of those examples that I mentioned to you. <clears throat> okay, so I, I included some slides in here so that when we send it out, you have the um, refresh. So there's some additional uh, hidden slides that, that have screen captures of what I've shown you, so you'll have it for reference. Um, <clears throat> one of the outputs of the of the app is uh, something that we look at as detectability, and and really, um, it's a nice way to see uh, the the example that we that we have um, as kind of a tutorial example <clears throat> starts off with an existing radar, and then. Uh, we change the requirements to to actually um, detect a smaller target, and so what do we need to do to the radar to detect a smaller target? We can turn the power up. We can, you know, maybe inc uh, increase the the elevation of the system, improve signal processing. Lots of different options to do. Make a higher frequency for, for better resolution. There's lots of different knobs that can be turned. When we export this data, um, the next thing that we're going to be looking at is saying, well, okay. I have a sense that this that this new design change will actually work in my system, but now I want to be able to apply it to um, <clears throat> to a scenario to see if it works. So this is actually a, um, a, a picture where we've integrated the terrain uh, DTED in information from terrain, and the radar the radar in this case is in the distance, and there's a um, a smaller target that's sort of loitering um, around the the mountainous area, and you can see um, <clears throat> this trajectory that we're showing here is actually the SNR value from a system engineering or system analysis standpoint to say, well, the target is this size, the radar is a certain distance. Tell me what my um, what my SNR is uh, of the of the as seen by the radar. <clears throat> and you can see that um, in this case, the red anywhere where it's red on this this curve, it means that there's no line of sight to the target. Anywhere where there's a color that's not red means that there's a there's an SNR that can be um, observed. Now the question is, what is that? SNR actually mean to the radar? Does it mean that the target can be detected? It depends. So, um, so we can actually use the output of the app that I showed you to um, modulate the um, uh, or apply it as kind of a, um, a mask on top of the, um, the SNR to figure out where the target's actually detectable or likely to be detected. And so <clears throat> that picture that we show on the left uh, turns to red green. Here, red means it's either uh, not in the line of sight or the SNR is not sufficient to generate a detection, right? And what's nice about this is as you start evolving the design and you put it into a real scenario, you can start to go from green to red and try to maximize the green portion in, in the equivalent version of this picture for your application. Oh, <laughs> we talked a little bit about um, the, um, the application for um, connecting up into the larger workflow for MathWorks in terms of using uh, the tools as an integration platform for multiple disciplines. And we've got a workflow that um, we start with requirements uh, in our case in Word, but this could be with other um, you know, requirements uh, systems. And we take those requirements and we map them to an architecture. So we have a product called System Composer where we build a radar architecture. Uh, it's a little hard to see here, but you can see there's a, there's a resource uh, scheduler, data processor, signal processor, the arrays, the waveform generator, right? The architecture of the system. This could be system of systems as well. And we then map those requirements to individual architectural components. We perform the design and flush out the design and then build a system model that, um, that captures the system. And so in this, in this example, basically what we're doing is um, is building up in the first, in part one, connecting requirements to um, architecture to design. And um, the goal will be to then connect it to validation, which is sort of the part two of the example. So we, we, once we build up our, our model, we're able to connect to, up to our, our Simulink uh, test and be able to trace every requirement to every component of the architecture, every component of the design, and every component to the, um, the test and validation strategy. <clears throat> What's nice about this, I think, is um, any place I've ever worked where we've we've had a there's been a contractual um, requirement to deliver uh, 
testability matrices and requirements matrices, they were always out of date um, because of just the nature of the, when they were due and, and, and the evolving nature of the design. And so what's great is this, this um, allows you to generate reports directly in the system uh, that, are, that are connected directly through. In, our, in this example that, I, that, I, um, that I'm referring to in part two, which I'll send you as part of the, the examples, um, we actually go back in and change a requirement. So we, we, um, we go back in and make a requirements change, which happens all the time, of course, on projects, and ripple it through. And, and the system sort of generates a, um, a red line through all the components that, that, that the requirement touches. So you can go back in and figure out exactly which architecture piece needs to be revisited, which, um, which part of the design needs to be revisited, and of course, which part of the test needs to be um, uh, redone or, or revalidated. So it's a great way to manage at the at the system level um, sort of what's happening, and um, it, it really can help improve relationships between um, you know different organizations throughout the ecosystem. <clears throat> All right. So part of what I've talked about so far has been on the on the backs of um, generating a model that that eventually has a high enough fidelity that you can feel good that's going to match what you're going to have in the field. Um, and we talked about those three those three uh, abstraction levels. And the common theme was that if I could generate a scenario that I could then sort of reuse across each of these use cases, there's some power there because um, that means that if I do something at the beginning of the project, it's going to have consistency with something I do later in the project. It's also going to have consistency when I'm, I'm sharing across different organizations. So if, if I'm doing something and, and my colleague at another organization is doing something, we're, we're starting off with the same kind of framework of what, what's happening in the scene. And, um, and I think the last piece is that um, if I have a different discipline on the team, like let's say I'm doing um, tracking and fusion, but my colleague's doing signal processing or somebody else is doing RF, I have a common framework to actually work with. A lot of the projects I've worked on in the past have been, uh, you know, the thing, the, the, the deliverable we got from one team wasn't digestible by the other teams. And so being able to plug back into this integration framework is important because you can um, you can really find problems and find in, uh, and smooth out the rough edges before you take the system uh, to, to, to integration and, and find it find it in the field or in the final uh, test before you're taking it to the field. So that that kind of sets the stage for this radar scenario. <clears throat> and um, for our radar scenario, we're really talking about building up a, a, a system where you can define um, objects in the field of view. Um, you can see here, I'm showing a cuboid here on the left where we give it a um, length, width, and height of the of the system. We can also give it a signature. Now I'm showing the radar signature here, right? I can define a cross section over frequency and define the objects that are in the field of view. I could have an aircraft uh, that's represented by, by this kind of a system. I could give it a signature. I could ins also install um, sensors on the on the platform or I can make it a target or I can make it a target and a sensor, right? So lots of lots of flexibility to mix and match. Once I have the um, the actors in the scene, I can model the trajectories in multiple different ways. One with kinematics, uh, one with waypoints, and you can also specify the coordinate systems in uh, geo reference um, <clears throat> coordinates like lat long and altitude <laughs> to, to, to generate a, a scenario. Uh, as I said, you can mount um, radars, and, and, and other sensors as well, um, like RF receivers or um, EOIR kind of platforms on the same kind of system and generate uh, uh, data in, in your system. The platforms are also um, INS aware, so, so you can enable um, the mode where you have an INS sensor on. So for example, if I had an aircraft and I had an um, array off the side of the aircraft, if my aircraft was um, you know moving like this, I'd be able to, um, understand the coordinate system of what's happening with the sensor itself, right? So if, if there's turbulence or if there's um, the, it's banking or something like this, then where it's looking is going to change and it's important for the, the sensor measurements to know what's actually happening in that case. Um, my, one of my favorite new um, aspects of, of being able to do this radar modeling is that <clears throat> not only can you use the same scenario, but you can, with uh, just one switch of the knob, uh, change what comes out of the radar model. And so what it means is you can generate IQ signals, detections, or tracks from the same uh, scenario in the same overarching uh, radar model that you define, right? So um, so it's, it's very uh, convenient to move between the types of, of abstraction levels. And I think um, what we see a lot of, of happening is that um, maybe you run the longer scenario uh, using the measurement level model where you're generating either detections or tracks, 
And when something interesting happens, like targets cross or some, you know, there's some interference present, you can switch over to the IQ and figure out exactly what's happening in that kind of a scenario. The other piece that I that I um, am really excited about is the ability to uh, perform Monte Carlo analysis in a way that um, allows you to perturb either sensor parameters, the ra radar parameters, for example, or um, perturb the ground truth of the trajectories in the scenario. So you can go from one to many uh, with just a few lines of code by perturbing um, the aspects of the sensor and also perturbing aspects of the trajectory in, in, in that sense. And that's a great way to uh, to generate data for testing. It's also, um, we've used it for uh, some of our AI, AI training models as well, where you have a scene that you wanna perturb and get lots of versions of that uh, without having to write too much code. Um, and, and you can zero in on the parameters that you want to um, to change. So uh, I wanted to highlight that. The um, <clears throat> One of the aspects that we have, and I showed you the Radar Designer app, there's also a um, an app called the Tracking Scenario Designer, which is part of the Sensor Fusion and Tracking Toolbox, but very similar um, kind of starting point with what I showed you with the Radar Designer. <clears throat> you, can, um, you can create new scenarios, um, but you can also pick from ones that you've already um, that you've already generated or you've already defined. So it's a very nice way to be able to share uh, starting points of, of uh, benchmarks, for example, um, across the across the team. Um, there's lots of different uh, platforms that you can you can configure. You can also add your own gallery of your own uh, platforms to pick from. So again, another sharing opportunity. Um, you you can um, there's lots of different uh, radar. So those are platforms. You can also generate radar uh, types. So um, it's easy to define your own um, radar here and have that part of the gallery that you share across the team. Uh, so, you know, you put the work in to define it, get, get it right, and then, um, and then proceed on, uh, to share it with your teammates. Um, this, this is actually an example where I had, um, that I had preloaded here that we have that has seven, um, seven objects moving in the field of view. And you can kind of see it play out over here. There's a couple of airborne targets, there's a ground-based target, and there's some targets of um, opportunity. I say targets here, in this case, the two aircraft and the ground-based one are probably on the same side, um, but each of them have their own signature as well. So if there was another, um, you know, radar or another sensor there, you could, you could um, their trajectory and their signature would generate a detection for somebody else as well. Um, all of the, the scene is generated with waypoints directly in the system. And you can see there's, there's actually seven, this is predefined as seven objects here. The tower is the ground-based one and all these other ones are aircraft. And um, for each of these guys, you can you can figure out um, exactly uh, sort of what the definition is in terms of um, of where it's mounted, what it, where it looks, what its detection settings are. Um, you know, in this case, the RCS, uh, the the R including the RCS and, and sensor accuracy in that sense. Um, you can also modify the trajectory directly in the canvas. So if you if you had some tricky trajectories that you wanted to work on, um, the best the best place to do that is in this um, in this in the sensor canvas where you're either doing it right on the canvas where you're you're um, moving uh, waypoints. Let me go back to an aircraft so you can see one a turning jet here. Um, so that's the, that's this guy here. Um, there's also a table a table view that you can look at that also shows. Um, a table and also an altitude uh, plot that, that you can use where you can actually just drag these waypoints directly up and down to move the the, the um, in this case the altitude or um, where what the actual um, waypoints that you want to use in your system are. When you're done with this, you can um, you can go back to the designer and and run it. And you have two different options here. You can simulate with detections or without detections. If you're doing it without detections, you're basically just getting the ground truth of the motion. So it's, it's a convenient way to create complicated scenes. And uh, if you do it with the detections, then all the code you can run <clears throat> will generate the actual detections from that, that system, from a statistical model that you've configured. And um, what's nice about that is you run it once, you can have that data set up and you can use it for your, for your testing later, right? You, you, you can build up uh, kind of a library of these corner cases of, of, of uh, things that you're worried about. Um, to that end, I, as some of the other, um, some of the other, like we, the Georgia Tech has a set of benchmarks that they use for tracking. So it's very easy to um, uh, to create those scenarios. Um, let's see, to create those scenarios uh, directly in here. So you see that there's um, there's multiple targets. The waypoints have already been entered in here to to match the targets, 
and uh, when I'm when I'm ready for this, I can um, I can just run this guy and um, and actually play it out and get the the, the detailed trajectories. Uh, in this case, I don't have any sensors on, um, but if I did, I could put a, a radar here that would actually. You'll see an example afterwards where we put a radar and actually look at the maneuvering targets. In this case, um, I can uh, pause this and and uh, step back and step forward. Right, it's very easy to um, kind of replay a scene just to see if I want to capture the exact sequence properly. When I'm done with this, same kind of thing. I uh, go to export and um, I generate the MATLAB code. If I run that code again, I can recreate what I've done in the in the app. Uh, so you can discover a lot of the, the building blocks directly from the app in that sense. Um, as I said, when you run that code, you can also build up um, you know, map files that have specific detections and trajectories that you can then use where you don't have to wait for that to be generated. You can just say, well, I made a change to my algorithm. I want to see how it does with this with this um, benchmark uh, scenario that I've had before. OK, <clears throat> um, so the other thing, you know, from a target standpoint, uh, depending on where you're <clears throat> where you're modeling, you know, which the abstraction level uh, models that you talk about, you've got a lot of different options. Um, you know, the simplest one, there's a target far away. It's it's a point target. We, we give it an RCS value that changes with angle and frequency. And um, we we can add fluctuation, these kinds of things, right? Um, and you see that kind of pattern on the bottom here, where you have a you have a target that that has a pattern that changes. Now, how do you get that target? How do you get that pattern? Well, you might measure it in the chamber and fill it into that container for the RCS pattern. <clears throat> we also have the cuboid world, which I, I talked about a little bit. We have a set of functions that you can use to generate shapes, common shapes. <clears throat> you can take those shapes and um, you know. Um, rotate them so that so that they look like um, maybe you have a, you know uh, one of the one of the examples we have is with cones and cylinders right so that there's there's um, different shapes that you can use that that represent standard things you might see in depending on the radar type um, <clears throat> you can also take those those shapes and put them together to form something more complex so uh, we've got examples to, to show how to do that um, we've also got cases where we take the the targets and wrap them up into some kind of a building block and you can like in that case um, you're basically having Micro Doppler, you can simulate Micro Doppler um, on the targets. Could be propeller, could be, we have pedestrian, we have um, a bicyclist, right? The, the same kinds of techniques can be used to extend anything that, that moves uh, with motion. You can also, if you have your own mesh, you can bring it into Antenna Toolbox and solve the RCS pattern. The output of that can then be reused in the, the bottom left there where I show the RCS pattern. Uh, and if, if you've got a something you measured in the field, or with another tool, you can also take the output of that and put it into that that container for um, for the RCS piece. And we've got it every any time where I show a tile on the on the slides. There's a corresponding example that walks you through each of the steps of how to do that. Um, I talked about tra trajectories a little bit already, but basically we have uh, different frames. The most recent coordinate system that we support is out, uh, the lat long and altitude. Uh, so these geo scenarios that that um, that work there, and that allows us to to work with. Um, some of these satellite type examples that, that I showed you at the beginning where you have um, things that are that are geospatial on the on the earth and you want to be able to um, specify it that way um, it's, it's pretty easy to do uh, I get the question a lot about um, <clears throat> you know if you have traject detailed trajectories um, <clears throat> see the waypoints make it easy for you to generate a trajectory um, without many points we calculate that the detailed trajectory and that gets used in the radar scenario but a lot of times you might have your own detailed trajectory. We have a workflow now where you can actually um, subsample that, use that subsampled output into our trajectory generation, and then uh, be able to use some of the, the the scenarios that I talked about earlier. Um, from a radar modeling standpoint, <clears throat> um, if you're familiar with phased array system toolbox from the past, all, all the building blocks that were available that are available in phased array system toolbox give you a, the ability to um, touch the uh, the aspects of, of of a model that would generate an IQ signal. So this would include the waveform, antenna antenna design, gain, all the gains and pieces that you would do, such that for each pulse repetition interval, you get a set of IQ signals that represent the return for that radar. Um, so that that all is still uh, you know alive and well, and that's and we just continue to expand that. But I just wanted to give you a sense that from a waveform model, that's the kind of piece that we're, we're talking about. And I'll show you a couple of them in example in, in one of the examples I go through. Um, from an array standpoint, uh, you know, you could design the any kind of array you want. Um, you can generate the weights, 
subarrays. Uh, we have new workflows on synthesizing array. This has been a popular request for a while. We had some um, some examples before, but we've augmented with um, a whole bunch of new optimization workflows that are so focused around generating uh, the array design, as well as even applying um, deep learning techniques to do it faster. So getting good results, but doing it faster so that maybe you can use them um, on the fly. You can model imperfections and failures. This gives you a great head start to, um, to generate um, like your calibration frameworks, for example. And all of the EMAG kinds of solutions, you have a couple of different choices. Our antenna toolbox um, <clears throat> makes it very easy to generate elements, design uh, elements and, um, and evaluate uh, how arrays perform using an EMAG solver. Of course, you get the effects of mutual coupling and those can be directly put back into the model. If you have measurements from the chamber, uh, from the field or from um, another tool, those also there's there's um, there's entry points back into the element design that you use in your system model as well. And as I said, um, a lot of when we get start getting into the EMAG piece and closer to the antenna, there's lots of uh, nice workflows that um, we first of all we have a library of of solved antenna uh, you know models that you can use to solve. Um, it, it's a huge library and it's it's growing every release. You can do install analysis, like um, looking at the RCS, as I mentioned, for, for a large structure. You can uh, look at cosite analysis where the antenna is on the platform and see how the, what the effects are there. Uh, it's pretty easy to fabricate, to go from your design to a Gerber file and send it out for, for printing or you know, for manufacturing. Um, the, the detailed RF models and also the, um, the propagation over, over the terrain, uh, which you saw a little bit of earlier. Same thing on the RF side, um, basically going a little bit deeper and going um, to the effects of, uh, of the link budget at the RF level and being able to take the results of that and putting it back into the system model. Remember I was talking about having a common framework to develop on and to uh, share data with. So that's exactly what we're talking about here. Now, <clears throat> I wanna show you a simple example um, that <clears throat> um, isn't anywhere as complicated as the ones I showed you with the satellites and the space and all that stuff in the beginning. But um, <clears throat> I think it, it, it effectively shows the, um, the plumbing between the models. So I just want to put, put, um, put some details on that and show you how we would go through that process of uh, moving between the model at layers. So the first, <clears throat> the first piece is if I was, what I did in the radar designer app earlier, I was looking at um, an existing radar design and basically what, I, what do I need to do to make it detect smaller targets? So I would get some parameters out of that, that workflow that when I export with the app can be used as a starting point in my measurement level model, okay? Now the measurement level model also has some additional things like where does the radar look and some other, other aspects of it that I'll show you. But, but basically you have a starting point to get that consistency, the consistent starting point that, that um, drives the measurement level model. So, um, so we'll have a similar scenario here where we have a radar. In this case, we have three targets that surround the radar. The ground truth is, is, is shown here on the left where you see the three triangles and the uh, radar piece. Again, very simple example, but just to show you the plumbing. <clears throat> we'll start off with a beam that, um, that's going to rotate around uh, through the field of view. And as it goes through the field of view, if the target is in the beam, then um, hopefully we regenerate a detection. Now, if I made a really small target and I put it far away, Statistically, I might or might not be able to see it. Uh, in the statistical model, also, if I if I move the target outside the beam, then I it's not visible, so I don't I wouldn't see it in this case. Okay. So you get a little sense of uh, sort of what's happening in the in the uh, model. We have this building block called the radar data generator that has about sixty parameters that you can configure to really tailor to the kind of system you that you're building. Um, most of those have smart defaults, so you know even if you programmed all of them you would do it once and then that would be the one that you would, you would share with your team. Here, because they have smart defaults, it's very easy to get up and running. You know, these are the only values I'm, I'm changing from the default. It rotates, um, I give it the update rate, where it's mounted, uh, what, it, what it scans, how fast it scans, what its field of view is, um, and its resolution, right? So that's, that's basically, you know, enough to get started with this kind of a, a system. And my loop is basically going to um, use that in this scenario with three targets, and loop through as the as the um, the beam scans around. And what's nice is the output of this um, data generator. So sensor is defined as a radar data generator, and I can get the, these detections directly from the model. Right? You'll see 
this model also has the ability to actually generate tracks directly from the model as well. But I have it set to detections here. And essentially, as I run this loop, what do I end up with? I end up with um, generating these statistical detections. And so one pass through the, the field of view, I generate a detection for each of these targets. Okay, so that's what the green diamond, uh, the uh, green diamond represents. Now, <clears throat> the the workflow that we that we have here it, um, allows you to take the starting point of your radar data generator, that one that has up to sixty parameters in it, and generate that. Use that as a starting point to configure a radar transceiver. The nice thing about the radar transceiver is now the output of that instead of being detections, is actually a signal. So you can see here, sensor IQ is a transceiver, and it's, and it's based on the parameters that you defined in the sensor, which is a statistical model, the measurement level model. And when I run this now, every time through the loop, I'm going to get signals that I can actually digest and process, right? So let's run that. And this is an example of one of the, one of the views of, um, for one of the targets here. And you can see this time varying gain uh, piece here. And, it's, it's a very simple example. You can see the detection uh, above a threshold. And now when I process those across the board here with those signals, I'm able to get um, this circle now. And that shows that um, for each of the detections, I generate equivalent um, IQ generated uh, detection, okay? So very simple, but you can see just with a small loop, I'm able to um, create that same workflow um, across using the same scenario to get ground truth, go to measurement level, and then go to um, detection level, uh, sorry, um, signal level. Now, <clears throat> what is a tr what's, what's in a radar transceiver? Well, all the building blocks that we had uh, that you can use to put something together directly are covered here. Uh, the, the waveform, the, the transmit elements, receive elements, and all the, the, the key information, such that when you hit run that line of code, <clears throat> the output of that is gonna look just like what you did in the measurement level model. So you have consistency between the two. Um, to make it consistent, the, the, this is just one example, the default uh, pattern that gets used out of the box is one that looks like what we do for the measurement level model. But with one line of code, you can add your own custom antenna element in or your own custom um, array design in to make it look like the system that you're, that you're gonna be um, building. And, and this could be taken you know, in, in depth and on all those parameters that I showed you earlier uh, for the IQ, the, the RF system, the um, the, the, the antenna pattern, the antenna elements, all the piece that you use, the propagation types, all these kinds of things, okay? Um, I talked a little bit about this. So I just wanted to show you this, you know, propeller design, uh, propeller uh, micro Doppler, anything that moves that's non-rigid non body motion, you can model uh, directly and then do the analysis to find out what's, um, what's happening from a micro Doppler standpoint. More recently, we've done something with hand gesture um, we've got stuff that's on pedestrian and bicyclists. We have um, uh, examples that show um, uh, blade rotation. It just on the blade rotation, you, you can get things like the number of blades rotating, um, the uh, the length of the blade, the tip speed. Th these kinds of things can be pulled out of the pulled out of the analysis. Lots of options for propagation. Um, environmental conditions like rain, gas, and fog are certainly there, and also um, <clears throat> the uh, multi-path and other, other aspects that you would expect um, for propagation, those can all be added in directly into the, the system. Um, <clears throat> the newest capability, which is coming in 22A, uh, which just uh, in a week or so, so, I, so this, this does include some 22A pieces, which is um, largely what I'm showing you here, is the ability to simulate clutter returns. And this is a big um, uh, update from what we've had in the past. <clears throat> so keeping to that theme, power level, measurement level, waveform level, you can you can model uh, clutter consistently across all all these of these areas, right? So the picture you see here on the left is <clears throat> the clutter of um, um, the, the clutter uh, um, sorry terrain in, entered into the system, and then looking at the signal over that terrain. Uh, <clears throat> and we'll we'll go through each of these examples. So I'll, maybe I'll just move on to the next slide here. So we 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 see kind of three common examples. The first one <clears throat> is that the um, that the target is actually occluded by the by the terrain itself. So you can see this pattern either on the ocean or on the um, on, on the, um, the mountain there. <clears throat> As the pattern is going, you can see the 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 holes in the pattern where it's being blocked um, from either a wave or or a land a land structure. <clears throat> um, we also can 
detect targets on the surface, which sets the stage here. You see the green and red lines are actually indicating whether or not it's visible to the aircraft, um, but also, um, you know, where is it on the ground, right? So being able to get the returns from the ground and deal with those as as um, as clutter, you know, generating what your what your system would look like there. But then also being able to pick off targets, uh, pick identify targets on the on that ground as well, uh, if they're not occluded. And then finally, using that as the base for SAR uh, imaging. So being able to take uh, a land mass, either create a custom one or import one from your from you know your your DTED data, and um, and basically put targets on that you can then uh, perform SAR on either from space or from from an aircraft or a UAV. So from a land surface standpoint, you know the the old fashioned the 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 easiest one to get started with is the flat land surface. Um, but the more interesting one is uh, is through DTED. See Mount Kilimanjaro here. Um, this is also um, the custom one where you can actually generate your own custom landmass so that if you just want to make it easy to give uh, especially mountainous terrain or make up your own, you know, you, you, it's very easy to, to generate that directly. Um, we've got lots of land re reflectivity models that you can use to represent the, the land. And this red and green is really more about what the, um, what the source model supports. So um, this is kind of a cheat sheet that you could see. Um, for each of these models, you can configure these directly in the system and use them um, out of the box. Um, anywhere there's a red, the model doesn't support that, um, that grazing angle, but you can get a sense for the coverage across frequencies and across um, low, mid, and high grazing angles, um, depending on where the sensor is. You can specify regions of interest. So this is a nice um, addition as well. Um, you know, you've got the pattern that you want to use, and you can actually define exactly where you're getting uh, the clutter. And this can include um, the back lobe and, um, and side lobe regions as well, in addition to the main lobe. Uh, so just a quick, you know, getting back to the radar scenario, we we would set up a radar scenario. We'd set up our radar data generator, which is the which is the um, the engine, the the measurement level engine that that generates the the, the measurements. Um, we define the platform, and um, we can add directly in. In this case, we're adding DTED data. We're defining the the reflectivity model of that uh, region that we brought in, and um, <clears throat> we're using that to generate uh, clutter. And so you know, oops, um, so you, you can define a, um, a region here and uh, focus the radar in a certain direction and get the returns from that, from that kind of a system. In this case, we're talking about at the measurement level. We can also do the same thing at the IQ level. So um, the other new piece, that, that was kind of the land surface. There's a corresponding view of the, um, of the sea surface. And you can specify um, the ocean um, uh, state in in the form of like wind direction, wind speed, fetch, um, and so that same that same kind of system can be applied to um, to the returns on, on uh, objects on, on the on the water. So this could be a ship, or it could be something even an aircraft where you're looking down and still getting clutter from from a wavy ocean, for example. Um, similar picture uh, for the uh, models type. This is just sort of a, a cheat sheet. I'll, I'll send you this, but lots of different options for standard models that exist. GIT is, is a Georgia um, Institute of Technology. <clears throat> the um, a Georgia Tech, I should say. This is this is the abbreviation they use in the literature. Um, <clears throat> the um, and again the same thing: frequency range and grazing angle. You can see here, in this case, for the signal level model you get a, a sense of the radar looking into the terrain. And you can see that area where the circle is, where the, um, the coverage is not, is, is basically occluded by the, um, by the land. And you can see what that looks like in the sense of, um, on the range Doppler display. So it just gives you a sense of, um, of sort of uh, what, what, what it would look like in the return data in that sense. Um, and this picture, same thing on the ocean, right? So the this is one of the um, ocean examples where you can see the, the pattern, um, and and what's being returned varies based on what uh, what the height of the wave is. Okay, this is the picture I want to show you. Um, <clears throat> you see the raw data coming back from the SAR system, the SAR image that gets generated. So we have you know you've created the scenario, but there's also algorithms to um, to generate and form the image, and then um, you can compare that to the ground truth where you have this um, this this um, high terrain area with multiple targets on here. And you can see, um, depending on the on the um, aspect angle, 
not all the targets are visible, but as the platform surveils and it becomes in there, you'll see that this, that this, um, you know, that, that they'll all become visible depending on what you do. All right, just a quick note here. Um, you can also measure, you can also model weather. We have um, uh, polarization is, is supported. So you can define polarized targets, polarized antennas. And so that uh, brings into the, the, the equation weather usually. So some of our colleagues at um, University of Oklahoma, <clears throat> the ARC um, had done a nice paper where they used the tools to model. Um, and we have a shipping example now that, that shows this, um, models the next rad system, takes the, uh, the target data from NOAA, uh, the National Weather Service, and basically used that as a system and tried to recreate what they see with, the, with NextRad. So it's very, this is just a picture of it, but there's also some um, quantitative, um, it's quantitative and qualitative comparisons of the uh, performance of NextRad versus the simulated system. They, they had some great results and it was nice to see that, um, that the framework would, would work in the case of um, the polar, polarization and, and polarized targets. <clears throat> um, everything that we do with the signal level model is focused on generating a data cube. If, if we think of, you know, multiple elements in an antenna array, multiple um, samples in a, in a returned pulse, and then multiple um, pulses to process, we can generate a data cube. And so all the beam forming, match filter, Doppler, Everything that you can do from spatial signal processing, we have algorithms for multiple algorithms for to apply to improve the signal, eliminate interference, get a stronger signal in the direction you're looking for. Um, once the signals pass that that part of the of the signal chain, then creating the detection, one and two D CFAR. Uh, if we have extended targets, being able to um, uh, Cluster, either cluster them into single targets or to figure out which detections come from a single target. Um, algorithms like dbscan are there for you to uh, do that, that clustering activity and, um, and, and decide what's going to be passed to the tracker, which brings us to the next topic is tracking. So Radar Toolbox actually includes a uh, multi-object tracker <clears throat> and um, it's there so that if you only have Radar Toolbox, you you, you can get started and track objects. Um, our sensor fusion and tracking toolbox has a, a, a broader library of tracking of, of trackers and also track filters. I show some of them here, MHT, JPDA. Uh, we have PhD trackers for um, that, are, that are good for uh, extended object tracking and also for uh, tracking in high clutter environments. Uh, we have grid trackers that are more used by in, in autonomous systems and maybe more uh, ground vehicles and urban environments. But the idea here is that you can, if you have your own detections, you can um, map them to our interface, which is the object detection interface. If you have your own tracks, you can do the same thing. And the reward for doing that is basically that everything downstream will work, the metrics and the um, visualizations and, um, and all the libraries of, of filters. We have two design points for the trackers. Um, one of them is uh, that you could just use a tracker out of the box. And the other one is that you can actually configure and build up and customize the filter exact or the tracker exactly for your application. Uh, what's nice about this is you can start with the with the uh, first design point, which is just use the tracker. And we have a lot of um, resources to help you tune the tracker, including optimization techniques you can use to uh, um, perform the optimization for um, of how these trackers these track filters get configured, process noise, and and all, all the the aspects that define uh, good tracking performance can be can be used directly in that system. <clears throat> All right, so um, when we move to the multifunction system, most of the examples that I'm showing here are search and track, but um, but we've got a lot of other examples that we just don't have time to go through. Like I said, each one of these topics is about an hour in, in length. So um, if we think of uh, frequency agility, PRF agility, waveform agility, <clears throat> these are all you know inherent in the in the um, in the system in, in the system modeling uh, framework, but um, but one of the examples we have here is a is an IQ level, the signal level uh, system, where we're generating echoes, doing the signal processing, and then based on what detection, what what the detection comes in, the tracker will predict where the targets are going, and then the resource manager will be able to see um, how the resources are scheduled between uh, track and search. So, for example, a target that's closer in, that's moving uh, more aggressively, 
can get more of the energy than something that's uh, you know a friendly object that's moving away from the field of view, for example. You're right; those, those kinds of decisions can be made. Um, so, so in this case, we're we're um, we're basically scanning uh, a, a narrow beam through a field of view, and we're 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 um, splitting our time between search and also between detecting and tracking um, objects. So in this in this example, you see in the bird's eye view, there's two targets, and each each of those bottom displays shows you um, how the track gets formed and and how it does in this in this kind of system. So I could change the array type, I could change the waveforms. All of those building blocks can be uh, modified in this kind of a scenario. Um, <clears throat> I showed you this benchmark in the in the uh, tracking scenario designer, um, but but these benchmarks were used uh, were developed for testing uh, tracking systems. So we ship these um, as well, and um, we built a set of examples around them that uh, that that run at the statistical level, the measurement level, that augment the one I showed you for the IQ level, right? And so um, so this same kind of a system can be configured with a radar. In this case, the radar is scanning um, the field of view of those highly maneuvering targets uh, that are based on the Georgia Tech um, benchmarks. And um, what you see here is that <clears throat> by default, the beams, there's two beam colors here. There's a, um, there's a, uh, a search and track um, beam form. And so it's going out and doing updates across the, um, across the system here and we're, um, on the bottom, on the bottom display here, you can see when it's doing search and when it's actually doing um, energy on one of the six targets. Okay, so you can see that kind of uh, balancing out. And when you, it, this this kind of a framework allows you to experiment with um, adaptive tracking techniques that are based on things like the RCS value of the target, uh, where the target is, what kind of maneuver the target's performing. And so when you look at at a system like this. Um, with, when we use the same update rate across all of the um, targets, I might be wasting energy. It's not going to give me any better answer on targets that aren't maneuvering. And so the, the idea here is that we can um, vary the tracking rates on e each of these objects such that um, for the ones that are highly maneuverable, I will put more energy on them to, to make sure that I have a better track as they're maneuvering. And so um, in this case, this is, this is some of the results here. So in the active tracking, where we're just tracking everything kind of at the same rate, um, you can see this, the, the mix between um, search and track. We're actually keeping up in the simple example of six targets, but if more targets came into the, into the field of view, we'd have to make a trade-off. And that's exactly what the adaptive tracking kind of system shows, is that I want to be able to free up more resources to, to do other things, in this case, search. And so by uh, essentially doing variable rate updates where if the target is doing an aggressive maneuver, I can put more energy on that target. And um, if it's just in a kind of a non-maneuvering uh, um, target, I can I can uh, do updates less and use them for other other things in the radar. So you get a sense uh, of um, you know being able to balance the books in terms of um, the finite resources that the multifunction system would have. Um, we we did something with um, with um, Alex Charlish uh, in, in at the, one of the radar conferences, where we we had a, a he, he had a, a great tutorial um, at the conference, and um, we did some companion examples that showed how to use our tools with the the examples he went through. So I'm happy to share those with you if you're, if you're interested as well. Um, but basically, it was the same kind of thing. It took this concept and extended it to uh, RCS as well. So so for example, um, if a target was far away and it had a small RCS, we might also have to try to keep more energy on it to keep it um, in track because um, because it was small and, and, the, and the returns we're getting weren't um, weren't adequate to keep it in track from from a long distance with a small RCS. Okay, um, this last section here before I talk about AI is just on deployment and um, the I, I mentioned this already a little bit, but basically think of any signal processing algorithm we have from detections to spatial signal processing. You can generate C code. Uh, or you can generate, um, we have workflows that show you how to generate HDL directly there. Uh, so this includes beam forming, range Doppler processing, generating detection, CFAR. <clears throat> These are all uh, possible either with HDL or directly with single precision C code. Um, so that gives you some flexibility in, in being able to deploy the code uh, on, a, on a platform. One of my favorite um, new uh, webinars that one of my colleagues did last year was on the R using the RFSOC and allocating this kind of a workflow to the RFSOC. 
some of the things in ARM, some of the things in FPGA and making that balanced trade-off. Um, in general, the data processing piece, a lot of the tracking piece, the workflow is really focused on um, C code generation, single precision C code generation. Um, most recently in this release coming up next week, uh, we've also focused on deploying some of our trackers to memory constrained resources. So if you had something in like a UAV or something that was, um, you know, didn't have unlimited memory or required um, static memory allocation. Those are those that's that's also um, available for the tracker. The other nice thing about generating C code for the tracker is that the speed up is like probably 40 X from what we, what you see in MATLAB, mostly because of the bookkeeping nature and um, and uh, control flow that, that a tracker would have. So um, so it's this great speed up. So even if you're just simulating and not deploying to hardware, um, the code gen uh, workflows um, really, really speed up the tracker in this sense. Um, I think the other piece that I had mentioned is that, um, let's see, um, mentioned the, the embedded piece. So, so the, the biggest new piece on the code gen for, for trackers is that, um, is that you have the option of generating single precision C code and you have the memory constrained uh, targets and you also have um, um, the move away from uh, dynamic memory allocation so that if the system doesn't support that you you, you can you can have a friendly uh, deployment to that kind of a system um in the hdl sense uh so for the c code it's it's pretty straightforward we have examples to show how to do it for all the algorithms and you know it's it's um if you have trouble if you if you want to try something like that you have code you want to look at we have examples but but we're happy to to, to help you get started with that from an hdl standpoint um we don't have uh, building blocks that are, are libraries of, of um, algorithms that are just off the shelf. A lot of the feedback we've gotten from our customers has been that they prefer that we give them um, building blocks that um, that are optimized so that they can put them together to do the end algorithm. So our, our, our focus so far has been on a set of examples that uh, where you can create the ground truth in the golden reference using the models and then uh, a step-by-step -step workflow of how to actually translate that into efficient um, efficient HDL across the system. As I said, my we have this for beam forming, direction of arrival, um, all the, the main um, spatial signal processing and detection generating algorithms. But that but that one that I mentioned that uh, is deployed on the RFSOC is a great one to look at if you're interested in doing HDL deployment because it it, it really goes into the detail and it actually runs it on the hardware um, in, in a working system. Um, but but uh, but all these examples that I, that I that I have, I'm just showing two here, but basically, you start off with the ground truth, tr ground truth for the behavioral algorithm. You build up uh, the HDL piece, and you can compare the results. and And you'll know when you're done when you get something that's close enough to what the ground truth um, answer was there for. More recently, the deep learning HDL toolbox uh, has allowed um, the deployment of um, of a network onto um, onto the system, and uh, and so. Um, one of the examples that I'll show you here in the AI section here. I know we're running a little bit out, a little close to the end here, but um, but but you can but some great deployment options for for um, networks for HDL, CPU, and GPU as well. So for that classification piece that I'll show you next, that's that's going to be the the answer for the um, either HDL toolbox or some of the other coder products that generate and deploy the networks. Speaking of networks, I think um, this is actually a talk we're doing at the um, Radar conference in a couple of weeks, but uh, but basically the um, the workflow is such that um, a lot of our focus has, in the past has been on the um, you know when you think of AI you think of modeling the network and, and that that piece, but uh, but on my side of the um, of the role we're really focused on the pre-processing and creating data sets so synthesizing data that, that that's high enough fidelity that you can use to train your networks and test your networks and then doing the pre-processing with the goal of improving the performance giving you some flexibility on how you deploy it. Maybe you deploy something with a pre-processing in, in a simpler network, for example. And also um, with pre-processing, you have the ability to reduce the amount of data that you need to train your network. So big, big gains in that, in that kind of a, um, a system where you're, where you're generating uh, data or you're collecting data. It can be a big, uh, especially if you're collecting data to train your network, doing that pre-processing can greatly reduce the amount of data you need to train your network. So, um, so I just want to show you an, an example that we've done recently. Um, I only have a couple more slides here, if I, um, <clears throat> but basically this the spectrum sensing we started where we we train a network, <clears throat> we um, we train a network um, by data that we use for synthesizing 
and so we started with um, standards-based waveforms, LTE and uh, 5G. We add channel impairments, we add the propagation paths, and um, we can use that to train the network. We see some of that data to test it and get an answer. But then we actually can take um, the uh, data from over the air and test it. So let's, so let's look at what we did here. So in the in the signal here, we're looking for um, spectrum sensing and 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 um, identifying what the waveform is. So um, our pre-processing step in this case is actually generating um, time frequency maps of of the signals that we have here. We have many other examples where we put the IQ data in and map that to the input layer of the network. Um, typically, it's expecting RGB. So in the case where we generate an image, it's a it's a clean map. But if we um, if we have IQ signals, we we have to do some um, mapping to the um, to the, the input layers of the networks that we usually use. We train the network, um, optimize the hyperparameters. There's apps to do, um, there's apps to do the uh, network development interactively, and there's also apps to do experiment of experiments to, to tune the hyperparameters as well. Um, if you have networks that you're using outside MATLAB, that's okay too. So, so, so a lot of the, all the training and signal processing pieces that I mentioned and data synthesis, that can all be used um, with, with networks outside of MATLAB, but, there's, but it really is pretty easy to get started with the MATLAB ones. Um, in this case, we tested with data that we, that we synthesized, but then we went out and um, with our software-defined radio, collected data from LTE and 5G base stations. And um, we got good results in, in general, um, the interesting thing for this was that, um, especially for 5G, we had used our 5G waveform generator app, which is this this one here I'm showing up on the top here, and generated some waveforms, but um, but only generate a subset of waveforms. So that we took data off the air, we re realized that the network was only identifying a portion of the spectrum that was um, that was actually there. We could see what it was there, and we're saying why why didn't it it capture the full spectrum? And um, what what it turned out was that we didn't we hadn't trained the, the network with um, the widest bandwidth signals in 5G. And so, um, so it was it was a great way to, to sort of get a sense of the interaction between, um, uh, you know, the iterative nature of this kind of a process where you go back in. We were able to go back in and generate additional waveforms, thousands of them. Go back in, retrain the network, and then test it with the data we collect on the air and get a better result. So that that's going to be the way um, you know most of these systems uh, work. And when we're done, um, this kind of a system can be deployed to um, one of the hardware platforms that I mentioned to you. Okay. Um, interestingly, this with all the news recently of the 5G interference with um, radar altimeter, we actually um, went back in and looked at some of the interference here. So we we actually went back into radar and added in the radar waveform, and then did the same kind of thing where we we now do that that same workflow, but we, we instead of just LTE uh, noise in in 5G, we've also got radar in this in this equation. And some of the some of the workflows we have with the looking at 5G interference with with um, radar altimeters also um, is a topic of a, of a future um, uh, session as well. We made some like, nice progress on that. Um, last piece, uh, just if you have your own data, um, if you have your own data for uh, uh, systems, this is a great, uh, for folks that have um, attended like some of the AOC sessions where you see, um, you know, looking at this kind of spectrum and being able to find signals of interest, we have a um, signal analyzer and a signal labeler app that really let you work with large signals and um, make it easy to plot and also, in this case, label signals. So you see this, um, this time-based signal and also the, um, the time frequency representation. In this case, we have, um, you can see the, um, what, the, what the system looks like. And notice here, I can go in and label directly in the time frequency domain of events of interest. So if I, if I did collect data off of a radio or, or an RF system, I can go in and um, either manually label the data um, directly in that sense, or I can, um, I can add my own functions up in the top here to go through and digest large data sets to go find signals of interest. So that that's kind of what this automated labeling workflow is. Basically, um, adding your own custom um, functions up here to to go through and digest the the data and uh, find events and also then label them as as events of interest. Uh, however, you're doing this. In this case, we're actually looking at waveform parameters, bandwidths, things like this. Um, when you're done, you can you can generate a report that, that gives you a status of where you're where you are in the labeling process, distributions of labels, how many labels you have in each category, and so on. A lot of building blocks to model radar systems, model the environment, get consistent results across the board, have a path to deploy what you what you build, 
have a, a nice way to share each aspect of your of your project and then also um, uh, apply more recently apply AI techniques. I think when we started with the AI examples that we did, um, a lot of times we would get a result that um, you know we could maybe do traditionally with traditional um, approaches, but um, but then we um, but I think as we started, you know, the more we go, the, the more we realize we take advantage of research that people in the field do, and um, there's there's lots of cases now where we have something that it's done faster with AI, it's done gets a better answer with AI. So it's great to see that um, that it's not just there as a academic exercise. It's it's actually you know being used and 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 um, we see this kind of thing. So um, okay, so I think for that, um, let me just see if there's anything else. I, that that brings me to the end of the, um, the session here. Um, let me see if I had something. I talked mostly about everything that I that I was talking about here, but just to get a sense of um, just to get a sense of the um, the the examples to get started with. Um, this is this is actually from our our twenty two a a release. So um, it says twenty two b here, but it's actually twenty two a. Um, you can see a lot of different um, uh, models to, to get started with. Getting started with the toolbox, um, lots of automotive radar, which may not be as more interesting, but lots of multifunction aspects. Um, AI, uh, SAR is, an, is another big area that we've um, focused on. I, I mentioned these system engineering ones, but we also have algorithms to form either through Spotlight um, or Strip Map. Um, applying deep learning to these these um, these applications for recognition and classification. And then also generating um, generating images from from data sets that, that we had um, uh, directly directly uh, that are publicly available that we could use our algorithms to see do we get the same answer as, as some of these other uh, what the ground truth represents so lots of different um, ways to get started here um, there's probably there's over 100 examples across the board between um, sensor fusion and and, uh, and radar toolbox so it's it's very um, very fast way to just pick something up and, and try to map to what you're doing. Okay, um, let's see. I saw I've been watching the questions. I haven't seen any questions, so but let me stop here and um, either have you come off mute and ask, or um, or put it in the chat. Oh, and thanks for attending today. Um, mm -hmm. This is hopefully um, hopefully it was helpful. I know I went through a lot of stuff. As I said, each topic we have a, a one hour session. We go into more detailed uh, versions of what I talked about, but I want to give you kind of a broad overview and put it in context of how some of the things work together. Um, and I did see at least um, one person coming in New York, coming to New York, so that's great to see. Uh, hoping to see more. Um, other, uh, any questions? Uh, thanks, Rick. Um, I hope that everyone did enjoy. I do have a question, I, I think, from my side. Maybe it answers something that the audience is also thinking about. Um, from the presentation, I think slide three or four, where you talk about the four different aspects. So you had the circle with the phased array and radar toolbox, and it covers four different fields, AI and uh, all the different sections. Uh, let's just see, it's that big circle at the top. Uh, I think it's slide three or so. <clears throat> yes, I uh, just lost my mouse here. Let's see. Okay, no worries. Um, I'm not sure what happened. Uh, let's see. I know. I know. I'm gonna go to that one and just do it yes. this way. <laughs> when I somehow my my mouse uh, doesn't show up, that's so. no, that's fine. Um, yeah. So slide. Um, I guess slide nine, right? Um. Yeah, it's the one with the phase in the middle and then the four different spokes kind of thing. Yep. Just go to that one. Yes. Yes, cool. This one, yeah, exactly. Cool, thanks. So I think for the audience, you know, uh, just a question around how these four sections split for personas. So, you know, if you're a system engineer, where would you focus if you are co-gen uh, developer, where would you sit, you know, can one person use it and, you know, learn all the tools and, you know, just be a, a one man saves all kind of thing um, approach. So do you have any recommendations or how this can be looked at from project management perspective or uh, program manager perspective? Yeah, um, so a lot of this is on the technology piece. I think if you think of, um, 
this this wheel uh, sort of maps across each of these areas, and that that's kind of what we're looking at. So if you look at like um, when you're exploring a concept, system engineer when you're doing the system engineering for the system, you're designing it, you're planning how it's going to be used, and then it's fielded and you're using it, actually getting data from the system. There's aspects of these that apply to each of those um, aspects of the project. Uh, so so for example, if you were if you broke this down by discipline, um, you know I'd say that the in my experience the system engineer has been involved at all stages of the of the application whereas um the number maybe all the disciplines are represented at each of the stages but like the person that's um actually uh building it or writing code for it might be more heavy you know in this section but to see if something's possible they may have there may be one person up in the front portion and then <laughs> maybe um their, their critical their center of mass um increases uh in the design and test portion where they're actually building yeah. something so mm -hmm. so if you think of it that way the we i have another slide actually that um based on my the projects i've worked on that maps the user personas to this to this breakout um and and it, you can imagine like system engineering presence is is there throughout so cross but, all um, basically yeah. yeah 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 but i think if you're focused on like writing code for something mm -hmm. you you may have your center of mass um in one of these things but you might have the sooner you understand what's going to happen the better you're going to be and better prepared for when you build it right and you can also mm -hmm. say geez this is going to be hard are you sure this is necessary i think a lot of the systems um i've been on many systems where um the system was over engineered and it took we, we we spent extra time um working on something that was difficult when in reality if we had done something like this we could have said you know what we don't need to do this or or, or vice versa we didn't we should have done some more work and we didn't and we and the system didn't work the way we wanted to we had to go back and fix it afterwards so yeah. both of those cases the more you can um have a, a, a voice at the table the sooner you can find these kinds of things and so having some presence across yeah. all of them is i think important cool awesome thanks uh anyone else from the audience have any questions um everyone good i think i might have one more if um I'm sure people would would like to know. Um, Rick, any sort of training workshops in that that they can uh, prompt for? So reaching out to us and then probably I chat to you kind of thing. Um, yeah. Or should they start off with examples? Um, what would you recommend? Yeah, the we try to make the examples so that you can just get started based on what you're looking at. If you have projects that are coming up, um, you can we'd be happy to meet with you and sort of um, give you the lay of the land of saying like, OK, if you're going to get started, you know, here's the four examples that will do what you're trying to do. Or maybe there's something that's in the works that we can show you. We do have a training course coming out um, in, um, I think, the May time frame, May or June time okay. frame. That's um, that's basically an updated version of what we used to teach. But it's really it's a two day session that goes through um, building up a radar system and taking it through all the phases and and um, linking all the pieces I talk about. But it's, it's a hands on session that, that uh, the training services group does. Um, mm -hmm. We also, yeah, I think those those are the main things. But we we also have some smaller videos coming that um, we're doing with with our one of our colleagues, uh, Brian Douglas. So those will be helpful. Um, oh, awesome. We have some getting started documents as well that, that, that go there. Okay, cool, awesome, thanks, Rick. Okay, I see a question from. Um, let's see, do we have a uh -huh. system tree to show what building blocks um, are required to perform certain designs? Yeah, I can include that. That's a good question. Um, a lot of what I what I showed you was with Radar Toolbox, um, and and, I'll, and and Radar Toolbox actually is built on Phased Array System Toolbox. So, with, when you have Radar Toolbox, you have a lot of the the building blocks to to do the basic. Um, you know, a lot of what I showed you here is is just Radar Toolbox. If you were going deeper on trackers and you wanted to use more complex trackers, then Sensor Fusion's there. I'll I'll, I'll give you something that shows you this. But uh, if you're designing your own antennas. Antenna toolbox is a great toolbox to look at if you're building going deeper on RF. So the taxonomy of what I show you there, I, I can I can show you that kind of tree that shows you um, that piece here. But I'd say about 80% of what I showed you is is radar toolbox um, uh, and phased array as a as a unit. And then um, you know of course if you're using AI, then the deep learning toolbox comes into play. Or if you're using so, but um, so so I'll I'll uh, I'll show you that as well. Yeah, I I also didn't. Mention this, but this is the talk we're doing at um, the talk we're doing at the radar conference. Basically, um, goes through this example, an example that that breaks this out and um, and shows the how the results are consistent across the different um, abstraction levels. Um, 
I'm happy to send that to you as well if you want to see it. But um, but it, but it, it's important that same scenario, different levels of abstraction. That's good, um, but they have to be consistent. And so that's um, that's kind of the that's one of the talks we're doing there is is showing. Um, and and there's there's examples that we ship that show this as well. But basically saying, well, if I use the app, I want to generate an answer. It get X. When I put it in the measurement level model, I should still get you know X. When I do the signal uh the waveform level signal level model i'm going to get x as well and, and and match those out and if i and if i make a change if i add you know if it's an x-band rate if it's a uh, millimeter wave radar and i add rain to the system and i didn't model it i can i can see exactly how that ripples through each of the each of the modeling types and get the same kind of results um other questions Rick, just a comment on the question uh, for those who would want to know the different tool sets and tool toolboxes. Uh, if you go to the MathWorks website and then you go look at re the radar toolbox and also under the solutions tab um, and go to radar systems, <clears throat> it explicitly shows, I think, the four different or five different sections of what tools are required per section, basically. So if you are dealing with RF systems, then you get radar toolbox and uh, RF toolbox and RF block set, etc. Um, if you're dealing with data analysis or mapping, you can get UAV and sensor fusion, for example. So that is all specified uh, as well. Um, yeah, so reach out and can share more detail with you. If you want to have a discussion with Rick, uh, please shout. I believe everyone in this session does have my email address from the meeting list. So yeah, if there's yeah. other questions, do shout. I was going to just mention too the um, like some of these guys. Um, if if it requires a separate product, um, then it's listed in the example. So if you if if you let's say you said, hey, I'm doing a SAR system, yeah. we could give you the the SAR examples and you could see exactly what's used there. For SAR, it's it's I think it's all um, radar toolbox. But like um, this example where we were doing, uh, I'm trying to look at one where multiple toolboxes are required. Um, I don't know. You know, like like I'll just I'll just show you a simple example here, like the the air mobility one. Um, oh, lidar and sensor. lidar. And so, and whatever example you're looking at, you can get a sense of what it's what was required to actually do that. So this one uses a bunch of the tool tools. You there's probably subsets you can do where you don't need all the toolboxes, but but basically for this case, we were using um, since we were generating um, a scene where we had buildings and then these multiple. Um, there's three UAVs here. You can see um, one, two, three. And then the um, the surveilling the ego UAV. Um, this has because it has lidar, it has radar and stuff like this. You you can see how they they work together here. But um, yeah, anyway, that's so that's a good way to look at it too. If you're seeing if you see something that you like, you you can see what's required to run it. 